listeners, welcome back to season two of the Climate Ready podcast. We hope you enjoyed our first interview with Indigenous climate change leader Tui Shortland as much as we did. For this interview, we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk to a leading aquatic ecologist about the concept of environmental flows and how climate change is fundamentally upending how we think about and operationalize stream restoration and management. As usual, I'm joined today by my colleague and co-host Ingrid Timbo. That's right, Alex. Hello, everyone. Glad to be here. I know we don't usually get into personal details here on the podcast, but I'll let you in on a little secret about myself. I am a big nerd when it comes to ecology. I love learning about how natural systems work and about how scientists are using that knowledge to help ensure that these systems keep functioning, even when we do our best to get in the way. Aquatic ecology is an inherently curious and dynamic field of research. These complex systems have evolved over millions of years to regulate our natural world, and they continue to evolve in response to rapidly increasing temperatures and extensive stream alteration. And just to pick up on that, we may have already brought this up on the show before, but according to the IPCC, freshwater ecosystems are particularly vulnerable to climate change, and they're already some of the most impacted systems globally. To protect and to restore these fragile systems, scientists are grappling with the reality that You know, we can no longer look back to the historical record with as much confidence to predict how ecosystems will respond in the future, since those underlying conditions are changing. One of the most prominent theories about how rivers function is called the natural flow regime, and we've invited one of the founders of this theory and leading thinkers in the field of aquatic ecology, Dr. Leroy Poth, to join us on the pod today to teach us about the basics of natural flow regime and how the theory and practice is changing over time. Before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and leave us reviews. You can find us on iTunes, Google Play, and most of the other major podcast outlets. We've also got a new Facebook page, where you can find us using at Climate Ready Podcast. Now let's get into today's episode. The Climate Ready Podcast is a product of AGWA, the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation, an informal network for water resources adaptation to climate change, focused on supporting experts, decision makers, and institutions within the water community to find common solutions for sustainable water resources management. The podcast is made possible by funding from the World Bank Group. For more on the World Bank and its role in supporting climate adaptation efforts, visit www.worldbank.org. We're glad to welcome today's guest to the Climate Ready podcast, Dr. Leroy Poff, a professor in the Department of Biology at Colorado State University. We'll be discussing the complicated relationships between ecosystems, climate, and water management. Leroy, thanks for joining us today. Hey, my pleasure. So, Leroy, the paper that really kicked off a lot of your work in this area came out back in 1997 in the journal Bioscience. It's called The Natural Flow Regime, and it's one of the most highly cited and influential papers in this field. I think our listeners might be interested to know a little bit more about the context at the time um, and and where the idea for this paper really came from. Could you speak a little bit about that? Sure. So back in 1996 or so, I was working for an NGO called Trout Unlimited uh, while I was also on a research scientist at the University of Maryland. And a colleague of mine from University of Maryland David Allen was uh, a member of the Technical Advisory Committee for American Rivers, and we had academic conversations as well as sort of NGO conversations, and we were not very happy with the way that flow policy was implemented in, uh, in rivers around the country. The predominant idea back then was that all that was needed to protect ecosystems and rivers was some level of minimum flow. and we wanted to shift that paradigm, if possible, to help NGOs and to help the health of rivers by focusing on a full range of flows, not just some minimum flow. And the full range of flows that would help, you know, uh, maintain ecosystem integrity and biodiversity. And so we basically decided to write this interdisciplinary paper that focused on the relationship between river integrity, ecosystem integrity, and dynamic variation in flow and not just minimum flow. It was sort of the right paper at the right time, and it became very broadly adopted. 
and has been very important in guiding how people think about environmental flow management of rivers. So you mentioned the concept of environmental flows, which which was really a, a key idea, a key focus in the seminal paper. So environmental flows or e-flows are a key part of the natural flow regime. But for those of us not really in the know, what is the premise behind e-flows? That's a good question. The concept of environmental flows does follow from this concept of what is the natural flow regime of a stream or a river. And most streams and rivers, of course, have been modified. Their flow regimes have been modified by human activities. Dams are a really sort of prominent example. And when they're modified, then the natural flow regime is modified. And that means that the ecosystem function of the river will change as well. So environmental flows is a way to think about how can we restore some elements of the natural flow regime in regulated rivers in order to promote some desired ecological outcome. In the bioscience paper, you propose that stream flow is a key driver of health in riverine ecosystems. Could you explain what are the critical components that make up the so-called flow regime? Probably for some of your audience, this term flow regime may be itself a little bit you know, undefined or vague. And so basically what we're talking about is if you look at the historical hydrograph or the you know the amount of water moving through a river over time for years or decades like on a daily basis you can then characterize the shape and the pattern of the flow that's coming down that river and if you think about flow levels uh, high flows floods low flows that are important ecologically then you can characterize certain aspects of the hydrograph that will translate into so ecological, you know, what I would call performance, you know, species diversity or abundance of species. And so these things that are important in that long-term hydrograph are things like the frequency of high flows and the frequency of low flows. Are they really common? Do they occur every few years? Uh, how long do they last? A particularly important uh, component is how what the timing of those high flows and low flows are. And if they're predictable from year to year, then organisms will respond accordingly. And so, you you know, because flow regime is largely driven by climate, there are differences in flow regimes across in, in rivers and streams across the U.S. and indeed around the world. So every river, while it does have a sort of a distinctive natural flow regime, there, there are similarities. Like, for example, snowmelt streams along the Rocky Mountains or in the northern tier of states are somewhat similar in their characteristic flow regimes, even though each of those streams might be slightly different from, from one another. And so these differences in differences and similarities in flow regimes based on the long-term historical record of stream flow are very important in helping us think about what kind of restoration we would do for a particular river or stream in order to restore some of its natural ecological function. And in the same paper, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about natural ecosystems, and also about modification. There was a, a great quote that I saw that says, the history of river use is also a history of flow alteration. So since this paper came out, you know, around a little over 20 years ago, have you seen improvements when it comes to river alteration? Have things gotten better or worse or, or some sort of mix? Yeah, that's a bit of a mixed bag. I mean, one thing to say is that since we uh, pointed out this kind of alteration, people suddenly started noticing it a lot more. <laughs> so there's been a lot more reporting of alteration. It's been pretty well quantified for at the national level, for example. And this is extensive alteration in rivers uh, around the country. And this is not too surprising because people use rivers for a variety of human activities and making their livelihoods. And that generally involves modifying the river to some extent. So what has happened in the last 20 years or so with the recognition of the importance of natural flow variability to maintain river ecosystem function, there have been more research in trying to understand uh, what this alteration means in terms of actual ecological change and how we can restore some of that hydrologic variability to recover some of the lost ecological function. So there have been lots of efforts to 
do experimental flow releases uh, from dams. So, for example, you know, Glen Canyon Dam uh, has released water into the Grand Canyon to try to recover some ecological functions. There are many other examples of that. So, the alteration is extensive. There are efforts to understand how to make things better through releasing water from reservoirs, and that's actually happening in, in, in many places, but there's a long way to go. One thing I would say is that the widespread discussion about the natural flow regime and how we might restore some of that to regulated rivers has really been effective in a policy sense in terms uh, that many states, for example, and even the federal government has largely adopted this natural flow regime perspective. And so several states have regulatory guidelines now and programs to try to manage water quantity as opposed to just water quality. And the federal government, which doesn't have sort of statutory authority over water quantity on a national level, agencies like the U.S. Geological Survey and the Environmental Protection Agency have promoted the natural flow regime concepts. Well, for example, the USGS has a uh, program in ecological flows, which can be traced back to pretty clearly to the natural flow regime concept and this idea that we need to characterize the full flow regime of a river in order to understand how it works and therefore what needs to be restored when it becomes modified. That's great. That's really encouraging, yeah, that there are better and, and more informed discussions being had. Well, and I would also add that, for example, in Australia, the Murray-Darling Basin plan, uh, which is very ex extensive and impressive in terms of trying to sustain ecosystems in the whole river basin, that plan was substantially influenced by concepts of natural flow regimes. Well, I think that's a really great segue into my next question, which really focuses more on how do you take these natural flow regime concepts and put them into practice, thinking more about kind of the policy and management implications. You have written that the environmental flows concept aims to, quote, define stream flow requirements that achieve desired social and ecological conditions in rivers. And much of your work since the 97 bioscience paper has seemingly centered around the socio-ecological aspects of environmental management. That led eventually to the development of the ALOHA framework, a fun acronym that stands for Ecological Limits of Hydrologic Alteration. With ALOHA, you're explicitly taking social preferences into account in determining optimal flow management standards. But given that human preferences and values often conflict, they shift over time and may or may not align with quote, ideal or natural management, at least, you know, from a hydroecological perspective, how do you reconcile the social and ecological aspects of environmental flows? I think one thing to point out right at the start is that the natural flow regime concept per se does not necessarily recommend that streams be returned to a natural state, right? So right. it's really more of a, an understanding of how stream and river ecosystems perform when they are given certain kinds of flows. So society, of course, has to make the decision about how we, what we want our rivers to look like, how we want to use our rivers. And in many cases, that's not going to be, let's restore it to a complete natural condition. What we need to think about is the co-use of rivers and streams by people and by nature. And so that, that involves trade-offs and that involves negotiation and you know some clear expectation of what we want these systems to look like. And you know, it's not so much in the US, but in many places around in more developing countries around the world, people, local societies depend very strongly on you know, healthy functioning rivers that are largely free flowing that provide goods and services like floodplain agriculture or native fisheries. So you know, this concept of environmental flows has sort of evolved over time from its beginnings as mostly focused on ecological integrity to now incorporating more explicitly the recognition that the flows are important for people and for social activities as well, for cultural needs, you know, et cetera. So 
it's not an easy thing to decide how much flow to put back in the river under a flow of dam or whatever, because it does involve you know, competing perspectives. And we should not expect that the guiding principles of any flow restoration is necessarily going to be you know, maximize the ecological function. It may be what is an acceptable level of ecological function that can coexist that can be sustained with social support given the competing human needs for the river. We're starting to have those conversations, I think, more so, and that's going to be really the future of environmental flows, is how you reach some kind of acceptable trade-off between human and ecological needs. Well, speaking of the future, you've recently written several pieces about the so-called rivers of the Anthropocene and new challenges for the environmental flows discipline. How have human-induced climate change, invasive species, and even land use change directly impacted both the foundational assumptions of the, the natural flow regime and managing for environmental flows? I guess, you know, hugely. <laughs> there was a paper, uh, a very influential publication in about 10 years ago now in Science Magazine by Millie and others. And, uh, it talked about how stationarity is dead, meaning that predictable climate cycles are no longer occurring we're moving into you know a phase of you know of changing climate and their take home message from that paper was that water management is in big trouble because water management has relied on sort of a well behaved climate cycles over the last you know many centuries actually that allow us to predict things like the 100 year flood or you know the maximum likely flood things that water managers care a lot about and that people care about too as climate is changing, we have less confidence in our way in our ability to statistically characterize what the hydrology of a river is going to look like in the future. That um, has really big implications because you know the natural flow regime is really based on the historical regime of a river, right? And so, for example, snowmelt regimes are shifting to more rainfall-dominated regimes. That assumption in environmental flows management that you can use the past as a way to set a reference condition, if you will, for some you know, future desired state, that assumption is being eroded as the climate changes and as the regime itself changes. From an, an ecological perspective, the introduction of non-native species and the spread of invasive species has also changed our ideas about what a reference ecological system looks like. This has tremendous implications for restoration because you want to restore a system to some historical state, well, that historical state may not be what the system would naturally look like now and in the future under the you know, altered ecological conditions of you know, new species having arrived and historical species having gone extinct. And in conservation ecology, the idea of a reference condition has been severely eroded. And so now we have to think about, well, now what do we do? Because we have to change our methods somehow in order to manage these systems sustainably. Yeah, I was talking to Ingrid about this earlier in the fact that you can no longer confidently look backward, you know, look at these historical baselines to come up with a realistic prediction of the future, given these rapidly evolving conditions. So have you and your colleagues been able to reconcile this eFlows concept with this new reality? Maybe we're not there yet. Maybe we don't have an answer, but I don't think that we've reached a dead end. I think the road has turned a little bit with eFlows. Well, I guess I, I would want to say that information about the past and sort of the evolutionary history and the historical conditions that have resulted in the currently observed ecosystems is really important information. And that still uh, provides a context for how we think about managing rivers in the future. So the historical conditions have you know, have set the boundaries under which species have evolved and how they perform up until this point. And so that information is really important contextual information. Now the challenge is because, you know, those historical patterns are changing. So, for example, the flood frequency may be changing in the Pacific Northwest as you're getting less snowpack accumulation and more rainfall uh, events. So the question is, how does that affect the ecological characteristics of a system that we care about, for example, you know, fish production or whatever. Understanding those specific linkages between high flow frequency and fish spawning success, 
pick an example, mm -hmm. if we understand those sort of mechanistic linkages, then we can use that sort of process-based thinking to project forward how different scenarios or different projections of you know, hydrologic change will play out ecologically. And that becomes somewhat of a guessing game, right? Because our, our knowledge is not perfect and how the future will unfold. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in that. But that's probably how we're going to be thinking about ecosystem management for the foreseeable future. That really gets at this idea of adaptive management. When we have these shifting hydroclimatic and ecological conditions, we need to utilize, as you said, more process-based thinking and approaches that can adequately adapt to newer changing realities. On this podcast, we talk a lot about the idea of managing for resilience when faced with dynamic conditions. Could you talk a little bit about that and how we can sustainably manage our riverine ecosystems over time? Yeah, sure. That's that's really important. And uh, I mean, you've used some terms there that people sort of throw around a lot. And therefore, I think there's not a, oftentimes there's we haven't reached a real consensus of what we mean by these some of these terms. Absolutely. In fact, Alex often asks um, our guests to define how do they think about resilience, for example. The way I use the term resilience uh, in the context of environmental flows and, and riverine management is sustaining the properties of an ecosystem that are resistant to sudden change when they're hit with an environmental stressor. What that means is that the properties of the ecosystem persist through environmental changes. Persistence could be something like you don't have species extinctions. Okay, species survive. They may their abundance may change, or their relative abundance may change, but the system itself maintains a similar function. So, how we manage for resilience, I think, is going to be a really big challenge because what we need to understand is the risk of failure of ecosystems or of ecosystem properties, the risk that those will fail given certain kinds of environmental futures. So we need to characterize that, we need to understand that, and then we need to lay that out against what the likely environmental futures are and sort of how fast the environment is changing, what that means for vulnerability, hence for persistence and therefore resilience. That's a big shift, I think, in our thinking from what we've historically done, which is let's just restore the system to some normative, you know, historical condition, and then we'll have, you know, we'll have resilience, right? But now the conditions are changing, the climate's changing, hydrology's changing, species composition is changing. So this becomes much more of a risk management kind of approach. By projecting risk into the future, risk of failure, if you will, for things we care about, then that gives us some guidelines as to how we need to, what kind of flexibility we need to maintain in our policy structures and in, in our regulations and in our management approaches in order to sustain those uh, system elements that we care about. And we're not going to be able to do that everywhere, I don't think. Uh, you know, there are going to be places where we're going to, where we know there will be failures. A certain amount of temperature change or a certain amount of you know, hydrologic change we know that some species just won't be able to handle that, right? So I think by doing this sort of risk assessment approach of likely failures in the future, how do we manage for resilience? Where can we manage for resilience uh, under projected changes that will help us prioritize you know, how we uh, apply limited resources across the landscape in order to try to maintain as best we can at, at broader spatial scales. Thanks a lot, Leroy. That's all we had prepared for you today. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? The only thing I didn't mention, I guess, was that in response to one of your questions about how we are as an environmental flows community adjusting to this challenge. And this might be of interest to your audience. I don't know. I wrote that paper called Beyond the Natural Flow Regime. You know, suggests that we are moving forward. But I think one of the motivations for rewriting that paper is that environmental flows is a difficult thing to get implemented because it costs money to move water around. <laughs> and I'm actually a little bit concerned that you know, the assumptions that are used in environmental flows that stem from the natural flow regime, which stem from the stationary climate and from reference conditions, both hydrologically and ecologically, that if the science community doesn't help the environmental flow community get beyond that, then that's going to threaten 
the credibility of environmental flows management generally. And, you know, that would be really sort of a disaster. Well, I think that's an extremely important point. You know, this issue of credibility, especially for managers who are initiating these huge restoration projects. I mean, it's like you said, it's really expensive to move water around. If these projects aren't able to achieve the outcomes that they're designed to. Or if it's just scientifically sort of not, you know, the knowledge base has moved on. People who promote environmental flows are sort of in a, you know, vulnerable position because it only takes one failure to discredit that. No, absolutely. Thanks for adding that. I think it's a really important warning and maybe even a call to action for river managers who are trying to implement environmental flows in this era of climate change. We really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us, Leroy. It's been a very interesting discussion. Yeah, well, thanks a lot, Alice. Good, uh, good chatting again, and nice to meet you, Ingrid. Nice to meet you as well. Thanks, Leroy. Take care. We want to thank Professor Poff for taking the time out of his busy schedule to give us, and our listeners, a better sense of how climate change is impacting the underlying science of the natural flow regime, as well as the implementation of environmental flow programs designed to achieve quote-unquote natural flow conditions. One thing that I think is important to highlight is that the major challenge that Dr. Poff outlines designing and implementing effective restoration and management projects in places where the historical norms may no longer apply is not limited to stream restoration. This challenge is faced by foresters, civil engineers, marine managers, and many, many others. I think it's safe to say that all of this is extremely important, even for those of us who don't directly work in the fields of ecology or river restoration, because it also speaks to the broader reality that climate change is profoundly changing how we think about future planning. To stick with the hydrological example, in many cases, returning streams to their historical optimal condition is neither socially acceptable nor is it even possible under altered ecological states. So we really need to start using process-based approaches to manage these systems. That means planning that is more focused on the interactions between flow and whichever environmental services that we care about, like fish production or floodplain agriculture. Exactly. It's all about the process. Regular listeners to this podcast will know that we've covered this idea from a few different angles in other episodes. For example, in our discussions about adaptation pathways or the EADS framework. Because we don't know with real certainty what the future climate will look like, at least on a local level, the safer, no regrets option is to focus on the interactions between ecosystem components and how we can help maintain or restore these processes under a variety of conditions. Because, as Leroy pointed out, the risk of failure can be catastrophic for river ecosystems. We need management protocols that are adaptive and can adjust over time to changing conditions. Ultimately, we hope that this discussion has been informative for you and how you think about ecosystem management under climate change. Let us know what you think on our Facebook page or in the comments section on iTunes. Now, before we wrap up, we again want to end with another postcard from the future, this time written and recorded by Stephanie Lyons. Stephanie is a consultant on climate, environment, and water projects, having spent nearly a decade as an analyst and advisor in the field working across the globe. She brings us an interesting story about resilient opportunism that I think you'll enjoy. About five years ago, I watched out my window as torrential rain lashed against the glass and the orange streetlights flickered out. The branches of the tropical trees along our street were bouncing and lurching towards the ground like they were trying to find something to cling on to and the howling of the wind really did sound like a pack of animals. This was my first time living in Southeast Asia during typhoon season. I was there working on climate change projects, and that day our boss had told us to stay home. A typhoon was heading for northern Vietnam, and we'd been waiting for the storm to hit all afternoon. Unusually for Hanoi, there was not a single person in a plastic poncho pushing their way through the rain on their motorbike. Not a single car on the road. The streets were empty, and the downpour seemed relentless. Suddenly, lights switched on in the building opposite. It was the only building in our street with a power generator that actually worked. A moment later, I saw a woman creep out of a neighbouring building and walk out into the water that was rushing past as high as her knees. She was carrying something. She scurried over to the building, ran up the steps, and put the thing down under the entrance. As she ran back into her home, 
I realised that she'd plugged something into a power board that was poking around the doorway. I glimpsed a tiny red light shining out through the sheets of rain. It was a rice cooker. My neighbour was cooking her family dinner, on the steps outside, during a blackout, in a tropical storm. Comical as the sight was, it was one of many little things that have stuck with me as a sign of how commonplace extreme storms are for people in places like Vietnam. When extreme weather hits, they're pretty used to systems just shutting down, and wherever they can, they find ways to adapt, ways that might be abrupt and reactive, or more deliberate and routine, ways to bounce back and continue their lives. As part of my work in different countries, I've had the chance to see lots of different types of adaptation, all the way from people making small changes to their everyday practices and behaviour, through to major infrastructure projects that have increased the physical capacity of communities to deal with impacts. Only a month before this storm, another deadly typhoon had hit Vietnam's central coast. In the aftermath, my team had visited Da Nang to see the results of a recent project. Working with the local women's union, it had delivered retrofits and training to a group of women householders to help make their homes more resilient to storms. When the typhoon hit, it was these efforts that kept the participating households safe, while other homes around them had suffered heavy damage. It's examples like these that I think of when explaining what adaptation means to friends or family who haven't really thought much about it. Most people know, at least in some abstract way, that climate change means we'll see mounting impacts like these, and our challenge is to comprehend the shifts we need to make in our everyday lives. But I also think these stories are relevant in my discussions with the people I work with, governments, donors, international organisations and not-for-profits. For a while now, everyone's been talking about the need for adaptation to be transformational. We talk a lot about fundamental shifts in systems and dismantling existing structures. We know there won't always be a backup generator to power a rice cooker during a storm. Climate change is a threat to the systems we rely on, and it demands that we change how we design and interact with them. That has to include understanding how people behave and the various social systems we interact in, and factoring this into our decisions. I wouldn't exactly call using a rice cooker in a storm an example of transformational adaptation, maybe more resilient opportunism, but I think it's important that we account for the knowledge people already have and the practices, habits and behaviours that, for better or worse, kick in when we're grappling with climate impacts. When I look back on this period in the future, I hope I'll be able to say that to understand our vulnerability and what needs to change, We looked closely at how people behave in the face of both extreme events and also slower onset risks. Transformation doesn't have to seem opaque or daunting or involve starting from scratch. To figure out how to make these big shifts, we should be constantly re-examining how and why people behave in certain ways and which practices we can build on or evolve. That's it for this episode of the Climate Ready Podcast. Thanks again to our earlier guest, Leroy Boff, and to Stephanie Lyons for her insight in this week's Postcard from the Future. Until next time, everyone. The Climate Ready Podcast is produced by John Matthews of the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation. It is directed and edited by Alex Maroner and Ingrid Timbo.